Don't you love these things? Yeah, I, I did. I saw a nativity scene, and all of them were mer- wearing masks. Even the donkey had the mask had a mask on. I once played a donkey in a nativity scene because I wasn't good enough for the other parts, I guess. In 1952, Operation Christmas Drop started. I would imagine that in this crowd today that somebody has seen um, a Hallmark Christmas movie. Is anybody willing to admit they've seen a Hallmark? Okay, a bunch, okay. Well, this wasn't exactly a Hallmark uh, movie, but it was along the same line. It's a story about Operation Christmas Drop. Three countries, United States, Australia, and Japan, have done this since 1952. It started in Guam at an Air Force base there, and planes fly all over those small islands in that part of the world, delivering gifts, much of it much needed supplies. Well, you know, when when Hollywood gets a hold of some of these stories, there's always some sappy part of it. And of course, there's a guy and a girl, and you know, they end up uh, smooching at the end of the thing. But um, I noticed they began to sing a Christmas carol. And since our theme today is joy, it was appropriate that the hymn they chose was Joy to the World. And this is how it went. Joy to the world, the time has come. I can't stand it when Christ gets pushed out of Christmas. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. We don't need to forget that. We sing a Christmas song called, uh, O Come All Ye Faithful. And at the very end there, we sing, O come, let us adore him. But it seems like the lyric has been changed. Instead of, O come, let us adore him, it's almost like, O come, let us ignore him. We can't do that. We can't do that at this season of the year. We can't do it as we live our lives. Yes, even in the midst of unprecedented times. Today I want to spend a a few moments talking about the manger. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to do three things. We're going to go toward the manger, we're going to go to the manger, and then we're going to go from the manger as we think about the significance of the Christmas story and what is the message that we want to convey. Someone has said, are you going to go home for Christmas this year? Well, maybe we ought to change that. Is Christmas going to go home with us this year? Are we going to take the true spirit of Christmas? Today I want us to look at, I believe, a significant word from God that helps us to understand that he has always been about taking the ordinary, the commonplace, and working wonders. Listen to the word of God. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrata, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come for me one who is to rule, whose origin is from old and ancient days. A man named Ralph Stockton said of this little town of Bethlehem, he said that the hinge of history is on the door of a Bethlehem stable. I want you to think about this. Because the birth of Christ changed all of history. We have B.C. and we have A.D. What does B.C. stand for? Before Christ. So when we look at the year of our Lord, which is A.D., we talk about the significant entrance, invasion, if you will, of the word becoming flesh here among us. Now, why would God do that? And did he do it the right way? We're going to explore that a little bit today. Why? Why Bethlehem? There are three three major world religions who think Bethlehem's a pretty special place. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. What's so special about it? And why Bethlehem? Well, 
Jacob, one of the old patriarchs of the scripture, married Leah and he married Rachel. Rachel was the one he desired more than any. Rachel was special to Jacob in the sense that she bore him two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. But as she brought Benjamin into the world, she died in childbirth. There, as you come into Bethlehem, there is the ancient site, the burial site of Rachel. So to those three religions, to many people of faith, that unfolding story of the patriarchs that led to the creation of a people and to a way of life, Bethlehem became special for that reason. We also read about a woman who wasn't from around there, from a place called Moab. She married a son of Bethlehem, the son of a woman named Naomi. Her husband died, and, and Ruth, who could have stayed there in Moab, decided to go back with Naomi to her homeland. It's a good thing she did because she met a, na a man named Boaz. They fell in love. And out of their union came a man named Obed. And Obed, as he grew into manhood, also had children. His son was named Jesse. And Jesse had a number of sons. The least of the bunch, the youngest of the bunch, the runt of the litter, was a boy named David. You see, as history unfolds, Bethlehem plays an important role in all of the stories that we read in Scripture. It became known as the city of David because that youngest son of Jesse is selected by the prophet Samuel and is anointed as king. Still the greatest king of the nation of Israel. Their flag holds as its symbol the star of David. David represents a great past, but it also promises a future. And as you heard the ancient words of Isaiah, you understand that for hundreds of years there has been an expectation how good are you at waiting? This is a great season of the year to wait, isn't it? Have you ever gotten in a line at the grocery store or somewhere else and you thought, you know what, that line's moving faster. So you leave this line and you go to that line and what happens? Well, either the register breaks or the clerk goes on break or all of a sudden the woman in front of you has a cart that's stuffed absolutely full. So you weren't so smart after all. We don't like to wait. We like things, we live in an instant society. Why do you think we have drive throughs at our restaurants where we buy our food in boxes? We don't like waiting. We're an impatient people. But if you look through the story of God through scripture, you'll notice how often the people of God have to wait. Hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, before John the Baptist showed up there in, on the Jordan River, it had been 400 years since they'd heard from a prophet. 400 years. How old is this country that we live in? You get a little bit of an idea, don't you? We don't have any sense of what it means to wait. They say then in Europe, they think in terms of centuries. And if you've been to Europe and you've traveled through some of those great cities and you see some of the massive uh, architectural creations of great cathedrals and other buildings, they think in terms of centuries because they can connect themselves to a storied past. How do we think of time in the United States? Do we think in terms of centuries? We think in terms of decades. We don't like to wait. We like things in a hurry. But this little village, well, let me give you a 
sort of a geographical connect here. You know how far it is from the church to the end of Nis- Nisbet Lake Road? Anybody know? It's about five miles, somewhere along there. Do you know that's how far it is from Bethlehem to Jerusalem? Just about five miles. So it's close to the capital city. There are other things we'll learn about Bethlehem as we go along. But did you know what Bethlehem means? Beth, Lahim, it means the house of bread. There was an itinerant preacher who some years later made this claim. He said, I am the bread of life. This little village becomes important to our story of what Christmas means. We know that it all began for this young couple with an order. Luke tells us about it. He tells us that a census, a census had been ordered. The emperor of Rome, who held those territories under his power, had commanded that the people be counted for taxation purposes. And a part of their requirement was that they had to return to their homeland. And much like Naomi had returned from this, the area of Moab to back home to Bethlehem, a young carpenter named Joseph had to leave his home in Nazareth to return to his ancestral home in Bethlehem. And there they arrived. His wife was pregnant. Now, I don't... I, I know this is surprising. I don't know what it means to be pregnant. I don't understand it. If it was up to us men, there'd be no babies. We couldn't handle it. I can't imagine traveling. Now, we don't know how, how, a whole lot about the trip, but it couldn't have been easy. And we don't know a lot of the details because we're not given those details. But we do know that when Joseph and Mary arrive in Bethlehem, All of those people who also had to return for the census had already gotten there. There wasn't any place. Now sometimes we read the story and we think, well, there's no room in the inn. And we think of a holiday inn or we think of, you know, some really, really nice place, a Marriott. In Bethlehem, there was no inn as we think of it. An inn was an enclosed space where people camped out. There was a central cooking fire that everybody could use. And there were stalls along an enclosure, along a fence. And if you were fortunate, you could claim one of those stalls to stay there. It was nothing fancy. It was extremely primitive. And there wasn't even a place for a young man and a pregnant woman to rest. We know that story. We know they couldn't find any room. You know who, who we always include in the story but it's never mentioned? An innkeeper. We like to make him a villain. But in all likelihood, whoever that person might have been helped Joseph and Mary find a place. It wasn't at the inn. It was probably in one of the limestone caves along the hills of Bethlehem. And you know what was raised on the hills there in Bethlehem? A bunch of sheep. Not just any sheep. That close to Jerusalem, many of those animals were procured by the temple in Jerusalem for sacrifice. And it was said of Bethlehem that the finest, the purest sheep that could be found could be found in Bethlehem. I want you to keep that in your mind as you think about the one who was born there in Bethlehem. A Bethlehem where things were primitive. There was no comfort, nothing fancy about it. It was the common made holy. I ran across across a a quote I'm going to share with you. It was written by David Jeremiah in a book you ought to read called Why the Nativity. Listen to this. Who knows? First century Roman reports mention a cave that was believed to be a birthplace of Jesus. And certainly animals were often sheltered in caves. 
Wouldn't it be wonderful to imagine in this very shelter that David had rested with his sheep many years earlier? He might even have composed the shepherd's psalm on the very spot where the good shepherd entered this world. Well, I don't know there's any way to prove that. But in the city of David, something spectacular was about to happen. The common made holy. You've probably heard stories of rags to riches, which typically suggest someone who has started out in very humble beginnings and somehow has made a name for himself or for herself and has achieved a level of success. So we like those rags to riches story, but you know what this is? This is a, ra a, a robes, if you will, to rags story. When the Son of God surrendered his own will to accomplish what humanity could not accomplish for themselves, it has been said that he took the crown off of his head, a crown of gold, and laid it down. And he stepped over the threshold of heaven so that instead of a crown of gold, he could put a crown of thorns on his head. Paul wrote these words. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, death on the cross. That's what you're worth. That's what we are worth. That God would think so highly of you that he would become lowly. That he would take something common and make it holy. You might not think of yourself as very exceptional. I've seen bumper stickers on cars that say, um, my child is an honor student at such and such a school. Have you seen those? I bet you haven't seen my child as an average student at such and such a school. You might not think of yourself in very high terms. Sometimes being average is not a bad thing if you're willing to be available. It's true, no one can help everyone, but everyone can help someone. We've heard some stories about some of the mission projects that you guys are involved in. Someone prayed this prayer. Oh God, grant that the heat in my heart might melt the lead in my feet. We know that Jesus went about doing good, but many of us just go about. Service is love, dressed in work clothes. I listened to Brent today talk to the deacons about the project in your sanctuary. And he mentioned a term that you're probably familiar with, sweat equity. I love seeing people who don't mind moving chairs, sweeping floors, taking out the garbage. Just helping because you can, not because you have to. I knew a guy who was a well-known uh, big church kind of pastor. And one of the members of his church came up to him at a picnic. The church picnic was out at the fairgrounds and it's a big event. And the church member had seen the pastor pick up a garbage can. And she was applauding him and applauding him. And he was using that as a testimony of how, you know, how good he was, I guess. Well, why shouldn't you pick up a garbage can? Why shouldn't you sweep a floor? Why shouldn't you do those things which indicate a heart of service? You know who that's modeled after? The one I read about just a moment ago. Who got down on his hands and knees and washed the feet of his disciples. And then he said, now what you've seen me do, you do for each other. When's the last time somebody washed your feet? When's the last time you wash somebody's feet? 
I've done that several times in services. It's, it's one of the most humbling things I've ever experienced. Because it's one thing to bend down to somebody's feet and begin to wash them gently and carefully. It's something else to sit there and let somebody else do that for you. It's a strange experience. I have very ticklish feet. I know that's something you really needed to know. Yeah. My wife, my wife decided that I needed a pedicure. She was going to get one. She says, why don't you come too? You ever have, have you done things you regret? I, that was one of them. I got in that chair and that uh, woman touched the bottom of my feet and somehow I was hanging from the ceiling at that moment. <laughs> Service is love dressed in work clothes. It's not the hours you put in, but what you put in the hours that matter. Now, those all sound like cliches. I get that. But there's something beautiful about simple, about showing up. This Jesus that we love and adore. He didn't come to the palace in Jerusalem. He didn't go to Rome and shove the empire, emperor off the throne. He was born as, as primitive a circumstance as any of us can imagine. You know, infant mortality in our country is still too high. We lose too many newborns. And with all of our medical technology, with all of our advancement, we still have the reality that childbirth is not an easy thing. Can you imagine what it must have been like, perhaps in that cave, when Mary was about to give birth to the Son of God. I can't imagine what Joseph was going through. I imagine Mary sent him for hot water because that's what you're supposed to do. Probably a midwife from the village came to help. But in those very unsanitary, unsanitary conditions, the one who bore those royal titles that we heard about a few moments ago from Isaiah 9, He entered this world just like you and I have entered this world. And he came on purpose. This is no accident. This is a design, a plan that was established from the foundation of this world. God determined to make common holy through the life of Christ. Let me read you one other quote from a man named Eric James. Think about this. Jesus for the Christian is the supreme revelation of the holy. Born in a stable, raised a carpenter's son, crucified a criminal. He was born and died not on days which were holy, but on days which were made holy by the way he lived and died on them. Jesus did not live in the Holy Land. The land was made holy by the way he spent his day-to-day -day life there. It was from the raw material of the very day, the ordinary, that Jesus fashioned holiness. And forever after, for the Christian, wherever we are, whoever we are, whatever the time and the day, the moment presents us in our decisions and responsibilities with the raw materials of holiness out of which the holy has been fashioned in response to God. Think with me for just a moment. Look who God chose. He chose a shepherd boy in a tiny village to become the greatest king a nation had ever known. He took a young unmarried girl and made her the steward of the precious Son of God. He took a Galilean carpenter who made his living working with his hands in wood and stone and other materials. A man who was asked to forego social custom and instead of casting out his soon-to-be wife, accepted the challenge of being the earthly father of Jesus Christ. 
He chose a band of disreputable shepherds who heard for the very first time the news of great joy. You see, shepherds were not allowed to give testimony in court because you couldn't trust them. Isn't that a little bit ironic? The people who are normally thought of as thieves and liars would bear testimony to the arrival, the miraculous arrival of the Christ child. And he chose a vulnerable, fragile infant. I don't know the last time you held a baby who had just arrived in your arms. But one of the things that I will treasure for all my days is that I was there when my two sons were born. And I got to hold them in my arms. And you know what? Neither one of them said thank you. Neither one of them reached up, grabbed me around the neck and hugged me. Not, neither one of them paid me for all that money we had to expend for them to get into this world. None of that stuff happened. They were absolutely vulnerable. And I was afraid that they'd break. My wife and I, we took our oldest son to our first gathering with our newborn son. <clears throat> and there was a group of people in the room. And the wife of the, the local elementary school, beautiful lady, she wanted to hold our son. And that was the toughest exchange I'd ever made. Because I was, I was absolutely sure she was going to drop him. That's how God's son entered the world. You can't have anything more fragile than a newborn. And God entrusted his son to us. Oh, come, let us adore him. Not, oh, come, let us ignore him. The common made holy. And you know what else? He chose you and me. Can you imagine that? If you were choosing a varsity team, would you be one selected? Do you ever have to do that? Get picked by, you know, a pickup game? And you're all standing there in line and two captains are picking people? You're ever at the end of that line? God looked at you and said, I, I, I want you. And, and I want you, Shirley. And I want you, Faith. And I want, I want each of you. That's how he feels about you. And you know what? I'm, I'm firmly convinced that if you were the only person in this world who needed redemption, he still would have sent Jesus. Don't ever think of yourself any less. Her name was Ainsley. She was eight years old. Like you're doing in several of our churches, we've had drives to collect food. And normally we would hand out a grocery bag with a list on it and people were to take the grocery bag, fill it up, bring it back. Well, eight-year-old Ainsley liked that idea, but she said to her mom, I don't think one bag is going to be enough. Mom said, look, that's the way everybody's doing it, so let's just fill up our bag. Let's do what we can. She said, I, I, that's not enough, Mom. By the time it was over, Angela had taken 27 bags to, to her neighbors and brought them all back full of food. Don't tell me one person can't make a difference. She didn't make a big deal of it. We did, because we were proud of her and thankful for her. Because she decided that she could do something that would make a difference. She would take something very common and make it holy. Now, she wouldn't explain it in theological terms. She just said, we got a bunch of neighbors, and we can collect a lot of food. And she showed up with 27 bags. I don't know what Christmas is going to be for you this year. It's certainly going to be different. But make sure you take Christmas home with you. And may the Spirit of Christ, that humble servant who gave his life for you, might be lifted up not just in our songs and in our words, but in the actions of our lives. Service is love with work clothes. Let's pay, pray together.
It's hard to find new things to say about Christmas. Oh, we've heard so many stories and sermons and lessons. But Lord, don't let it get old to us. Don't let it be something that we allow to pass without thanking you and serving you and loving you and praising you because of what you did. Because of Christ, we have hope. Because of Christ, we have peace. Because of Christ, we experience joy. So we ask, dear God, in the midst of some trying times and some struggle, that we keep our eyes on that manger. And as we head closer and closer to Christmas, may our thoughts be of him more than they are of all that goes with this season. For God so loved the world that you loved us enough that you gave your only son and all of those who believe in him will not perish but will be given eternal life. It all started with the very first Christmas present and how we thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if um, today is a day for you to make public a response. Maybe God's been working in your heart, your life. Maybe there's something that, as Nikki mentioned, there are places of service right here in this church. And maybe you've done a lot, but you can do something. And you can help. Maybe you've never served on a committee or been a part of a ministry team. Here's a chance. Maybe today is the day you can count on me. I look forward to serving with you. I, I look forward to getting to know you and love you and help you to understand what a great future this church has. Look around you. Not all of us are here this morning. Some are having to participate at a distance. But we're all a part of a family. And you know what? In a family, everybody, everybody serves. Everybody works. Everybody contributes. And everybody benefits. Today, if you want to make something public, maybe you just want to come up here and pray. Maybe you just want to bow your heads when we sing here in a moment. But this is a precious time. It's a time we'll never re retrieve. This is this moment. Let's not waste it. I'm going to be down here, and if you want to come and have a prayer with me, I'd love that opportunity. But as we worship now in music, remember what Christmas really is. <laughs>